come and tell me first. <laughs> anyway, a big welcome. Uh, I know that some of you have um, been along before, or came to the first um, event that we held a few weeks ago. But for many of you here, this is a new, um, a new first time, maybe to come to the events that are being held by some of the coaching venture. But also maybe the first time for people even to come here to the university.
question. So while you're all listening, you might be thinking about the bloody difficult question, the uh, BDQ that you might be able to offer to David at the end. So thanks ever so much, David, for coming. And um, I'm going to invite you really now to start your session. And we'll be, David will be talking for about four to five minutes, and then there's going to be, and I think there's going to be lots of opportunity for discussion during that time, and then there'll be a question time at the end. But probably you wouldn't mind if people chatted out questions anyway. Is that well, right? Well, if, whatever you want to do. This is a conversation. This is the, one of the things that I'm very conscious of is if you know where the conversation is going, it's not coaching. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Um, um, so, please do interrupt, make comments. Um, this, is a, this is not, a, I mean, I have some things that I prepared, but we may not go in that direction. And just as in a coaching conversation, we might not go in the direction that anybody thinks they're going on when we start. Um, I will say one of the things about the BDQs, I'm, I'm Near, near to completion of my first app, <laughs> which is over 70 situations that coaches and mentors meet, um, and at least five and sometimes up to 15 questions to ask, um, that you can, you can look up and ask to, to, to really unfreeze them, to get them thinking. <coughs> you know, like you know, um, when people procrastinate, you know, what's the best time to procrastinate? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I do like the bloody difficult questions. Uh, I collect them all over the place. Somebody gave me a wonderful one in South Africa, which I really like. It was, it was a Jewish lady, and you understand why, but I'll tell you what the question is. Do you have the courage to be happier than your mother? <laughs> <laughs> isn't that fighting? Um, and, um, well, you can play today. That's lovely, isn't it? Let's move on. Um, um, and uh, the uh, one I asked a bunch of bankers, uh, recently, which is quite, quite interesting. Actually, if you, if you go back, uh, I'm not, not sure this is really politically correct, never mind. If you go back into, into the original Celtic, pre Celtic languages, yeah, the B, the V, the F, and the W were all the same letter. You're already there, so yeah, I think you have to think about that one. <laughs> you have to think about that one. Um, but I asked, I asked do you feel that you contribute more than you take? And that was quite fun, watching the expressions on their faces. There was a sort of, not a shuffling of feet and looking away at that point, it was rather fun. So, um, I, I certainly enjoy the art of helping people, who may help people think. In fact, one of the ways that I would define what we call developmental coaching and developmental mentoring together, I define them in terms of helping somebody with the quality of their thinking about issues that are important to them. So, I'm going to share with you today something that we, we are just about, I think on Monday the book came out, but everything goes to the publishers. Our latest book, number 55, mm -hmm. which, which I've been writing with my colleague David Mickelson and with Susan David from Harvard. And, and what we've been looking at, we've been looking at the issue of goals in coaching. Mm -hmm. And go, I, I guess my interest in this goes back all the way to when I was a young journalist working for McGraw Hill. I was a managing journalist. And my hero was Peter Drucker. Um, yeah, great, great um, person. Who, and I was following, trying to follow in his footsteps from being just a journalist, because I he was partly academic. Yeah, and, 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 I, and, I actually, and I have actually, he has actually influenced my career greatly. Um, uh, and um, one of the things that I liked, for example, it's attributed to him, though I'm not sure whether it actually was him, but it, it sounds like he's the kind of thing you would say. But when he was a journalist, he thought that. Journalism was just badly done research. Now as an academic, he said, I realise that research is just badly done journalism. <coughs> and, and I thought that's wrong. I rather like that. He also told me, he, he also, I interviewed him two, two or three times, and he, he also told me, you know, when you get to a certain level of eminence, you can, you can, you know, sometimes you're stuck for a statistic. So I always find it, it was quite easier just to make one up. <laughs> nobody, nobody ever checked. <laughs> no, but this is fun. So I decided I would do it. So the next week I was giving a speech on <coughs> some aspect of, cu of customer care. Um, and so I sort of waxed lyrical and said, um, of course, it always costs five times more to get a new customer than to keep an old one. Uh, and I've seen that quoted in papers and, and every other, like, all sorts of publications, hundreds of times. Um, and I, it was just made up like that. So, so you will never believe anything I tell you. This has got to <laughs> So, in terms of goals, one of the things that Peter Drucker 
was, was famous for was his promotion of the concept of management by objectives. <coughs> the fact that you need the objective, or if you are very specific about the objective, you focus down the objective. Instead of trying to do everything once you, you set up what the priorities, focus on those, set your target, your vision on those, then, you're, then that, that has greater effectiveness. And I believed it, and I accepted it. Um, and then started to question it. A number of things happened. My co my co co was at Dave Banks and I, we often ha it often happens. We, we, we're interested in something in parallel, and then we suddenly find that our interest comes, comes together. And David had been interested in, 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 and a number of his clients were basically unhappy about the way that they, the, the, the goals that we expect, they were expected to create in, their, um, in, in, their, in the coaching sessions. And I've been doing my PhD, I've been doing a lot, a lot of research around it. Um, the, the, whole, the whole issue of mentoring and how, and one of the things, the side things I looked at was goal, goal clarity, goal, uh, uh, goal commitment, and goal alignment, but which means having a sense of purpose for the relationship. And what came out of my longitudinal study of 80 pairs of mentor and mentee was the interesting result that actually goal clarity and goal commitment weren't associated significantly with anything. That, that it was irrelevant to the quality of the relationship or to the outcomes of the relationship. That was a surprise. Um, having a sense of purpose for the relationship was closely correlated. So, you know, interesting things here. So, let's come back here. You know, so, the, the question comes up, as it, was, as it, all, it always does for me, what is the research question? The research question, what is the evidence that, got, that having smart, smart goals or specific goals in coaching actually is functional? Because after we got the growth model, haven't we? You know, it's nice to get rich and waffle. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but but you know, it's, it, it, a lot of the mental models, models in coaching have the, the goal. You've got to set a goal up first. John Whitmore you know, he, he promoted this but very strongly. Interestingly, in a recent interview, John said it was, the, it was the one thing he regrets doing most. <laughs> but he never intended it to be that to, you, you always have to start with the goal. There was four things that had to happen in the conversation. You didn't have to necessarily follow in that, that order. <coughs> uh, and there's a number of other things that, that, that he said actually were sort of quite going back quite strongly on the original message around it. Um, but you know, the, 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 the evidence, what, what was the evidence that there was the goal, the high level of goal focus work? <coughs> and so what we've been doing, we've, we've been gathering evidence from coaches, we've been gathering evidence from, from, from various bits of research, doing columns of research analyses. In the new book, um, we've got we've got contri contributions from Ed Decky from you know, expectancy theory people like Ed Decky from some of the immediate disciples of Locke and Latham, the, all the key people in uh, in goal theory, and we've also got contributions from a whole range of uh, academics in coaching as well, and other people. Uh, we've got Kathy Clam from and looking at, at it from the mentoring side. Do you all know Kathy Clam? Was the Amer original American researcher who who who, 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 who um, Came up who, who looked at, at um, uh, the, the way that or, or, or stimulated the whole body research that happens in, in America around mentoring. Um, uh, and uh, so fascinating, one of the opinions of all these people, what we've actually discovered is that it's not as simple as people make out. And the stuff that you read in textbooks and you learn on coaching courses actually is overly simplistic. It's rather like um, the, the, the the same sort of questions that I've been asking in, in I'm not, this, is, uh, this is the only other I'm going to do, but I've got a couple of books here that, that came out th th this year. But this, this one is all about uh, uh, um, talent, talent management and succession planning in organisations. And the research question here was, if all this stuff that we do, talent management, succession planning, all these nine box grids and things like that, uh, if they actually work, how come the wrong people sort of get to the top? <laughs> and how come the diversity at the bottom of the organisation in spite of all these billions of pounds of dollars that have been invested in, isn't reflected in the composition at the top. Why is it still, in, still twice as hard for a woman to get promoted into the next layer of management than a man? No. If you don't work, and, and the answer is, of course, because it doesn't work. It's all HR bling. Glitters, <laughs> yeah. Um, things like the nine box grid, no evidence that, you, that, that, that it has any impact at all, um, other than to create self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, Ellie, am I, am I making the HR people I'm sure you begin to quake here? Um, the, the, the only time you put people in boxes is when they're dead. 
Um, and these metaphors, we have talent pools. Yep. What is a pool? It's shallow, it's stagnant. Um, and what it means is you have a talent pool, it means you can, you can identify who your talent is, so called, um, and ignore, and then forget about it for the next year. Um, talent pipelines, leadership pipelines. What's a pipeline? It's narrow, constricted one way, and leaky. <laughs> Um, and uh, what basically, the metaphor that you choose creates the way that you think about things. So what it means is you focus all your resource development resources on a narrow group of people uh, on, uh, who, who actually you, you, you have decided you're talented, but on, base, on, on a basis which actually is extremely dodgy. Um, and indeed, when we looked at the evidence, we couldn't find any evidence that was credible that was able to, that was able to demonstrate that the current, the, all this paraphernalia that HR uses, this bling, yeah, that it has any greater impact on, on identifying talent than simply with, uh, saying people with big noses are more talented than people with small noses. Yeah. You would probably get the same level of quality and, and so forth, the same impact if you chose people on, that, on, a, on a basis like that. So what we found is some of the same myths are available in, coach, in, in coaching relating to goals. And so, uh, what we found, for example, um, that there's two schools. So there's a whole school that says that goals are absolutely central. You've got to have a smart goal. You come in, the client's got to say what they want, and you work on what they want. Um, and you, know, you measure the success of your coaching by did they achieve whatever it was that they said they were going to achieve. Um, and of course, the client sponsor, who's probably got a vested interest in making sure that the outcome comes out, um, is, is, is part of the whole, that whole package. So you've now got a nice conspiracy, if you like, um, to go around the, 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 the importance of your goal there. Um, Miles Downing talks about above the line and below the line goals, but there's still goals set at the front. You know, they're, 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 you, you, you identify the goal, then you get on with it. Um, and most of the subsequent authors about coaching, they, they tended to talk about goals as something that are fixed. Um, but all the experience from the most that we found from talking to highly effective coaches, the ones that have been you know, the really effective, is that goals are merged. That whatever goal somebody brings to you in the first meeting is going to change, it's going to be different if you're allowed to. If you just focus down on that original goal, basically you're taking the person in the wrong direction most of the time. Um, and some of the critiques of goals, the, 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 the quality management people from all of these sort of things, you know, from quality management, from, from adventure sports, so climbing, there's a great study of climbing Everest. You know, how many people die because they were overly focused on, on a specific goal of getting to the top, even when they knew that they would, that, that, you know, even with any rational mind or rational analysis would tell them they were going to die. But the goal became over, became, became super ordinate to them. Um, uh, and uh, the most psychologists and psychiatrists are looking at this, and particularly the clients are saying, actually, we don't want to do this. You know, we actually want time to work out what our goal is. In our observations of effective coaches, in, 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 in the conversation that we have, uh, with, 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 in, in the, the coaching or mentoring conversation, one of the things, again, that we've observed, we've seen coaches and mentors at work, is that the effective coach never takes for granted what the coachee says at the beginning as being the issue. They always contextualize it, contextualize it, contextualize it, until it's clear whether that really is the goal or whether it's evolving into something else. And that's as true in the immediate coaching conversation as in the longer or the larger picture, the larger goal they set. So I thought it'd be useful so, so, um, these are all some of the names. And, 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 it gets very boring to, to, to go through them all, but um, Narcissat Ach was one of the first people. He, 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 he turned the tendency, I mean, basically he said you have a vision, an image of what you want to do, that creates a determining tendency, so it sort of pushes that vision, sort of draws you towards it, and then you, go, then you get to dark tracks. Well, fairly obvious, you know, I think he gave rise to that great German phrase, Ach, so, um, <laughs> that's a terrible part. Oh. <laughs> they do get worse. <laughs> You've got lots of people like Goldwitzer, uh, um, you've got the Management of Objectives Movement, you've got Lock and Lathan, you've got Bandura. These are all names that those the academics among you will, will, will recognise. And the, and the practitioners among you will be useful to shrug yourselves and say, do I need to know? 
Um, and probably not, and, and Deputy and Ryan's self-determination theory. Would it be helpful if I just gave you a sort of quick run-through of some of this stuff? Yes, yeah? okay. Um, I have to remind myself by it, because I get bored by it too. Um, but um, if we, yeah, if, if we take um, Locke and Lather, um, basically what, um, what they were saying is, is that goals are sort of regulatory mechanism. Um, uh, and and that so if you if you have the um, the right per, per places if, 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 if you sorry, sorry, work out exactly the right way to say this, um, the, the goals should be challenging. They should be specific, um, and then you should and you should be able and you should be committed to them, and and you should get feedback from. Them. So there are those four aspects. If a goal is specific, if it's ch if it's challenging and stretching. Um, and then, and, and if you're committed to it, and if you get positive feedback, then you're more likely, then you'll get better results, you'll get higher performance than in other circumstances. So, um, just saying, um, just just think it would be nice to achieve something, um, that if they say it's not very effective, you've got to actually really focus down. Um, the, um, then Bandura started to look at some of these things, and he says the more capable people feel themselves to be, the higher the goals they set for themselves. Um, and therefore, the more committed they are to them, and therefore their performance is likely to be higher. So, this, you know, there is some positive research, and this is all good empirical research that we're doing. Um, there's another bunch of people who come from people called Carver and, Sh and, and Shea. You know, a goal is a reference point, so it's something that you look forward to, and you make changes to diminish the gap between where you're thinking you are and where you want to be. So, all this is quite you know, familiar stuff. Um, however, when we actually look more deeply, some of the work by Leighton in particular, when they looked at some and, and, and others, what they found was that this stuff, all this stuff about very specific goals and, um, and, and focus only works when the goal is short-term and specific and simple. As soon as you get into things that are complex and require more learning, a performance goal doesn't, you, you don't get the results. And you have, if the more that you focus on learning, the more effective it is. And so actually the performance bit, the, 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 the solid, the specific goal that you set, becomes almost irrelevant when the task is more complex. The more you focus on learning, the more the higher the performance. So we're into a different, man, a different, a different kind of situation here. Um, so if you... I mean, there's loads of I mean, Deputy, Deputy Ryan, and the, the, also our expectancy theory. You know, if, if, if you have the um, the, the, the right, um, they, they, they've got three things that they, that they, that they go, go for, and I, I always forget them. Here we go. It, it's uh, people succeed when they feel confident, first thing, as they expand and, and uh, exercise their capabilities. They succeed when they feel relatedness, so they're connected with the group. And they, they succeed when they feel autonomous. So those three characteristics, the competence, relatedness, and autonomy, seem to be the things that actually enable you to, you, know, you expect to succeed because you have, those, you have those feelings, and therefore you do succeed. Uh, and again, lots and lots of, of, of data there. But one interesting thing that comes out, or implications of that is, that goals are often collective goals. And the most powerful goals are collective ones, not individual ones. And yet, what are we doing with most of our coaching? We're focusing on individuals. And so, the, the, this, the, the research actually is not as simple as it seems. Then we've got stretch goals. Um, stretch goals are interesting. Lots of organizations use stretch goals. And then, a couple of years ago, there was a nice piece of research that looked at stretch goals in more depth. You, you all can't stretch goals. You, know, you give somebody a task to do a target that really is beyond them. You don't know how they're going to do it, but, if you, and, but you, you, you tell them, you, you, you can do this, and off they go. And nobody's done any real research into whether it works. What do you think the research said? Goals with the stretch goals were achieved. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What the research showed was most of the time it doesn't work. And the times that it does work, there are two there, there, there are two things that have to be in place. 
One of those things is, is that they have to be coming to this from on, on a groundswell of success already. Yeah? So you've got to have that, that almost excess of enthusiasm and self-belief. The second thing is that you have to have the appropriate resources to enable you to do it. And in, in the particular study that looked at this, what they found is most of the organisations that were setting stretch goals for people were doing it in an environment where they were basically up the Watsit Creek without a paddle and needed to dip it and, and suddenly needed, you know, needed to, to, to change things. Uh, but of course, you're now in a position where there, people don't have self-belief and, people, and you don't have the excess resources to invest in these major changes. So, not surprisingly, in most of the cases, the stretch goal didn't work. So people, are, so as coaches, you know, what's the environment in which somebody is being set a stretch goal? Is it one where they have tremendous self-belief and a team around them who echo that self-belief? Or is it one where they, they are actually in dire straits and this is a sort of desperate remedy? Because if it's the latter, we're wasting our time. In fact, we, 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 I would say that if you know this and understand this, it's unethical to actually help to, to you. You need to help to ground rather than to try and persuade them to go up and say where they are going to fail. So lo lo lots of, of, of interesting things there. Um, I, I've just got some, I put lots of random no notes down here for things that, uh, that I thought were fun. Uh, level 5 being a shoot, but you, you can probably come across that. That's you know, the, the idea of will being an important thing as a, as a determining factor, along with authenticity and uh, other factors. Um, I don't think there's much to say about that, but, and certainly not in terms of the criticism. But an interesting piece of research I, I did like was set by a guy called Sene and, you know, and his colleagues. Um, and what they were looking at was goal-related behaviour and, in, and, and introspection. So, so the, 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 how you talk to yourself. <laughs> and, they, and they were looking at the whole you know, what happened, what, what was the inner talk? And what they were looking at was, in, the, in their experiment, they asked people to, to, to say things like, Will I go to the gym today? Or I will go to the gym today. Yeah? Now, you know, which do you think was more effective in bringing about behavioural change? Cons and, and, and the consistency of sticking to, your, to, to a behaviour change goal? Will I, because I've got a choice. Yes. The will I, did not, and it's more proper, and, 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 and the, that's yes. exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> It, what it means was, you then continued the dialogue, and therefore your attentiveness was higher. If you said, I will go to the gym today, you forget about it, immediately. But if you said, will I, you're constantly thinking about it. Therefore, a large amount of what happens in, in, in goal achievement is actually the mindfulness factor. What are we attentive to? Otherwise, we lose sight of our goals. Um, and so I, I think there's some, some, real, some real fun things there. Um, so, you know, the, the guys that really push goals um, uh, talk about, you know, goals and clarity, the need to challenge, the need to commitment, the feedback, and the task complexity. This is the, the basic uh, rock and make them stuff. Uh, <coughs> and they point out that if you're working towards a goal and constantly looking to see where you're going, that actually provides a motivation in itself. And that appears to <coughs> have some validity. But the smart goals, you know, uh, specific, measurable, attainable, or agreed, uh, rather than time bound. I mean, they actually tie it down a lot more. Uh, uh, and that's where it all goes wrong. Because if you try and apply smart goals to situations that aren't simple or simplistic, then what you do is to, is to, re is to focus people's attention on the wrong thing. Um, or you f even if it's the right thing, you, you focus their attention so they can't see what's going on on either side. So one of some of the work by Dominique <coughs> Guevara um, in, uh, in, in INSEAD, around career self-management, what she found was that people who were, had smart career goals and relative you know, were actually less likely to achieve them than people who had somewhat broader, but not out here, but had a sense of direction and all the opportunities that were opening up for them. But if you said, that's the job I want, the probability of getting it was much lower. And the same thing, I sometimes liken it to, to the bloodhound, you know, that can follows the trail, sniffing along the ground. The, you know, the hunter's standing here and say, well, it's over there, actually. I mean, the bloodhound is going all over the place. Um, and, so, and so what is your, having 
an, a, an appropriate perspective for the objective that you're seeking. And the other side of this is it, it, come from, it's, a, it's a great book called Goals Gone Wild by a um, lady called Dominus uh, and her colleagues. Um, and you know, these are all the things, some of the things they find. Then if you come across this book, God's Gone Wild, it, I, I recommend it. It's a, it's a lovely read. It, 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 it's a nice antidote um, to consultant speak. Um, um, uh, my, uh, the one is definition somebody gave me years ago, the consultant. The consultant is somebody, uh, is a guy who knows a thousand ways of making love and hasn't got a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I know, I think that there's a lot of truth in that. Um, we are just initially taking it in this order. I've, 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 I've got a more detailed description of it here. First one, because goals focus attention, they reduce attentiveness to other factors that can help people get there. So this is the, 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 the careers factor. Um, it makes it so much easier to focus on the wrong goals. Um, one, of, one of their case studies is a health service, or a part of the UK health service, where they reckon uh, that hundreds of, uh, of unnecessary extra deaths have been caused by focusing on the wrong goals. Um, narrow short-term goals tend to promote, and this is a quote, myopic short-term behaviour that only that harms the organisation in the long run. Um, and again, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of, 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 of demonstrated research around that. People motivated, motivated by a specific challenging goals tend to adopt riskier strategies than those to those when, who, who have less challenging or vaguer goals. In particular, that phenomenon stick cuts in when you set a challenging goal to somebody and they are just about to miss it. They're not quite going to get it. There's a strong association there with unethical behavior, cheating, you know, a whole range of things, which it, it actually promotes um, dishonesty. Um, goals also uh, inhibit, inhibit learning. Uh, that's, uh, that's their quote. An individual who's narrowly focused on a performance goal will be less likely to try alternative methods, methods that can help them learn how to perform a task in a different way. Um, goals, doing goal, goal, smart goals, do increase intrinsic, extrinsic motivation, but they may also harm intrinsic motivation. And other research actually shows that where you are focused on short-term performance goals for, indivi for, for, for individuals, this frequently has a negative knock-on effect that they become less socially aware, less less willing to collaborate with other people. Um, and, 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 and basically, the, the, the socialization effects that are so important within an organization disappear. Um, whereas if you've got learning goals, people are far more collaborative and share things, and, 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 and so you've got a very different me mechanism going on. Um, fear of success is a, it's a psychological concept um, developed by somebody called Stephen Gross. Um, and it explains how highly goal-oriented individuals get almost to the point of success and then sabotage themselves. I mean, it's a well-known you know, psychological phenomenon. Um, and we find actually, for many coaches, this is something when they, 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 they feel that they've done something desperately wrong because they collaborated, they colluded with the client to get to this point, and the client gets there, and then it all falls apart. And the coach thinks, what did I do wrong? Well, part of it was over-focusing on that goal rather than on focusing on what's going on in, in terms of the individual himself. Um, Robert Keegan, in writing out in that new book, is very clear that the, the coaching is, 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 is about helping people <coughs> realize their potential, and that <coughs> the starting point is not necessarily the goal, but, but they, they are self-understanding. And the, 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 there's two kinds of goals that you can go, you can, he talks about. Um, goals that, 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 that tinker with the, 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 the system. So uh, adding, adding, a, adding a bit of software, you know, the, the, yeah. and, and goals that actually go to the fundamentals of who the person is, what they want to be, and their, their overall um, um, raison d'etre. Um, and, and those are therefore changing the whole, the, 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 system, the system that drives us. And, the, and differentiating the, the most coaching, performance coaching tends to focus on the former. We're going to get a bit of behavior change or, or a different outcome by fiddling, just tampering with little bits of, of, of who you are and, and, and your job. 
whereas, whereas the second form of coaching actually gets, so if you want sustainable change, if you want things to really, if you, if you want to, 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 to have change that makes a big difference for you, you've got to go back into your identity, your sense of self, what you value, the sense of who, of your, of who you are, what's important for you, um, and how you function as an individual. Once you do that, then you can start to, to, to that your goals will inevitably be mutated into something much, very different. You may incorporate those original goals as part of the journey there, but it will be a very different kind of conversation that you have. So those are the kind of things that, 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 that we found uh, from our own research, and of course from their, their research. Um, and I've really covered most of this, um, you know, so let's look at it. Yeah, so to you really, what do you think? Um, in your, how many of you are, are actually practicing coaches? Okay, so uh, some, most, most of you. Um, and the rest of you will have some knowledge or interest in coaches that would be coaching, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, so in your practice, do you want to, do you want to form into a few groups and just take a minute or two just to talk to them? Yeah. What, 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 how do you <coughs> go about goal setting up? Um, and, goal, and goal management too, if you like, in your practice. <laughs> So you expect them to take some responsibility inappropriately moves between the coach and the client. Yes. And what I noticed about goals, which I had never realised till tonight, mm -hmm. is that the goal can become the third party in that, and the coach and the client can inappropriately push responsibility there, and you've just got another place for it to be shifted instead of keeping it in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a nice convenient, convenient, convenient crutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And an inconvenient pressure. Yes. I wonder if a better way of thinking about them is that they should be dynamic um, rather than sort of set at the beginning and you have to adhere to them forever. So, 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 so be, the goal should be dynamic, yeah. rather than, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think what, what, what my own perception of this is that we've got, an, we've got a, a process going. Where somebody, they, I call it an itch. You know, something that somebody knows that they isn't quite right, mm -hmm. um, and then it turns an itch can be converted into a question, mm -hmm. and the question could ultimately could be, could be translated into a goal. But if we try and rush from a, a favour from that itch to the goal without actually asking the question in between, or what actually happens is we ask a question and that question leads to a better question as we think about it. So I think mm -hmm. what's happened the dynamic is about the, the, the quality of our reflection, our, our self-questioning. So I think maybe that captures what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I was just wondering, is it sort of more about the coachee directing the goal? And, and although we call it a goal for this evening, but it might be just because there are people that actually want outcomes, they want to see a result. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you might be with somebody and it's their drive 
of their outcome. Uh, I know these are different words, but, you know, fabricating in different ways, but, but, it, but there might be a need for outcome or something. So it's not the coach, but the coachee needs more of that power. Sometimes people, some people need a mechanical process to build yeah, the but, but, but it's about empowering yeah. somebody, actually. So it's not necessarily the goal or objective, but it's actually how do we, as a coach, empower someone? But it might be that some, I'm just suggesting there might be some individuals that like to have outcomes and results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and whereas others we, are very laid back, you know, happy to go. Yeah. And, but we must, of course, assume that that's the case until we actually find, work mm. out. And then, of course, the question is, whose goal is it? Mm. Is it really their goal, or is it a goal that they have absorbed? Mm. And so, many of the people that I've worked with, or either directly or through supervision, the problem, that, or the problem, the issue, is the goal that they've been working on, is something that they have absorbed from their parents or somebody else. Well, there is that as well, yeah. 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 Mm. It's a sort of tacit set of assumptions about what good looks like and what, what they ought to be doing with their lives, mm. um, which are not really congruent with their own values. Um, yeah. And some of the work by Anthony Grant has been looking at some about congruence of goals. Mm. Um, uh, and you know, a lot of people are working on goals which actually don't fit their, their identity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not surprising they don't achieve them because, of course, you're going to sabotage yourself if actually you don't, if you don't, if the outcome is something you don't truly value. So there's a whole, whole range of, issue, of issues there. Um, and it, the pressure is made worse because the sponsors, the people who are paying for the coaching within organisations, yeah, tend to want, sit, want, want to be able to tick a box and say you've achieved this. But it's the wrong thing. Or it's a simplistic thing. You, you tick a box on what you can measure, not on what the actual values of the coaching is. So, uh, some thoughts? So the one thing that um, I found, and you talked about that, is that it's not about there's too much attachment by the coaching and the coach to a goal. When I mean attachment, in that it can get in the way of creativity. Yes. And so that doesn't allow you to move in many different directions, you know, because the coaching is very multifaceted. Yeah. It doesn't allow you to move. So that creativity and innovation in their thinking, and as you said, how they get to where they need to be is stopped by too much or too much attachment. Yeah. When I end a coaching session, mm -hmm. I always get people that go through four eyes. I get people to say, what issues do we discuss? What ideas did we create? What insights did we have? Mm -hmm. And what intentions do we have? Um, and, and part of that is actually to capture the creativity of the conversation. Uh, but if we're doing, if it's totally goal focused, the only thing you can ask is, well, did we achieve what you set out to for this conversation? Mm -hmm. And that, that's not necessarily what, what's going to be most helpful. And if it is, and you said, and if it doesn't happen, yeah, then everybody feels disappointed. I failed. And which is the attachment, which is, is damaging. Yes. For both them and you. Yeah, and sometimes, sometimes when you actually look at a goal, Time frame, even though you may, you may really want to do it, when you look at it, the time frame in which you want to do it is not necessarily the time frame of the coaching. I'll give you an example. I was also coaching somebody over in England, must have been about 1993, a young man, and um, in 1999 he landed from Germany, and we didn't really get anywhere at that time, and he said, I got to the goal. Sort me out. Well, could tell me. But as you say, yes. that visioning process, that was the mm. way to do. But it wasn't the right timing. Yeah. To achieve. And time and again, we find that the, the, the impact, the real impact <coughs> of the coaching isn't during the six months or so the coaching assignment happens. It's a year later, two years later, three years later. That's when the penny drops. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a bringing together of circumstance um, and the, that deep reflection that goes on in, in somebody's head, and the reflection process takes time. It's rather like what the research we've done, we've, we've done around, uh, non empirical research that we've done around um, uh, the, the, the use of training line managers as coaches. Yeah, and, and Stephen Farrar's work shows very clearly that mostly it doesn't work um, for a whole variety, variety of reasons. But what we are, I identified was, was, was that there were two main reasons that we, that, we, that we found. One was that you send people off on a two day sheet there. Yeah. And they come back and they're all enthusiastic and they're going to start behaving differently. And the first reaction of the team around them is, I 
I wonder what pills he's taking, and can I have some? <laughs> um, you know, because it's completely dissonant from the normal behaviour. Um, and of course, because the, the leader and the team are part of the, part of the system, they, uh, in, and, and system, in systems theory, you change one little bit of the system, the rest of the system works very hard to get back to normal. So everybody feels more comfortable when you go back to the way you were, which happens within two or three days. <laughs> um, and the other factor that goes alongside this is that you can't change the way somebody thinks. Some, I mean, because co coaching is something, you are a coach, you don't do coaching. If you do coaching, that's a different thing. But if you are, if you have that, that, that mind frame of being a coach, that takes time to absorb. And probably, you know, it takes at least six months to get to think like a coach. How do you know it takes six months? Uh, because that's what people tell us. But yeah, we could be that that. But, <laughs> Yes, but, but I mean, yes, that, 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 that's generally what people say. I, I sort of got this message, but it, after a while, it's taken me this time to really think about it. How long does it take longer? Oh, I think it probably does to get really to get really into the, into the the marathon. But but people actually recognising that they are thinking differently and behaving differently. Mm -hmm. People on on courses on on coach training courses. Would that, that's the kind of set term that they, that's when it starts. If you like. Just for my simple vision work, I would I, I observe coaches that come in with all the the tools, the tools, especially yeah. their programs, and it takes time working with people and gradually. Understanding, getting to a place where they, they recognise they can be a coach. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, in a minute, I'm going to come to that and I'm just going to show you some, some stuff that, that actually picks up on that. So I'll, we'll hold with that one. Get into it. I was just thinking about the work of Rona BT on the Darth yes. which confirms what you were just saying in terms of the, the line manager as coach. And you said the A developing leader mm -hmm. rather than just applying some coaching skills. And that made me link back to your point about the type of coach you want to be. Because if you're client-centred in your approach, which is what you were describing, mm. do you want to be a goal-focused coach? Yeah. And certainly the new Yossi Ayers in Lane Cox book, which I've just started reading, is Very saying, good book. yeah, it's a good book, but it's actually saying, you know, this is an approach that professional coaches can use, goal-focused coaching. And that's what Yossi really is advocating in his PhD. So, you know, I'm a bit cynical. I haven't finished reading the book yet, but I'm a bit yeah. cynical at this point. I was actually suggesting the coachee sets the goal. Which is client-centred. Which is client-centred, so, yes. What yeah. coach you want to be? Mm. What label are you going to give yourself, if any? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to come back to that next. To that, I mean, because I, I think there's a big difference between being a skills-based coach or a performance-based coach mm. and being a, um, being a, a, um, a behavioural trans um, transformational coach. Yeah. And it's the level of difference you want to make to something. Um, and in, and in, in our shows, what we've been looking at is different kinds of coaching and mentoring. But what, you know, what's the contract that you've got? And you, the, contract, the, the, the style that you take to predict the outcomes that you get, without, without doubt. But I'm not going to read these, but you know, I mean, this, these are just some of the, 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 hit, the comments from, 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 from Spine. Yeah. They're so true, aren't they? Could we start with a question of clarification? Sure. At the beginning, you said um, uh, three things about goals. You said, um, you said um, goal clarity, yeah. goal commitment. commitment, and then you said goal seek. Goal purpose, so per goal alignment. Alignment, yeah. alignment. And you said that the, the first two are not very really connected to success, but you said that a third one, goal alignment, is. Yeah, so having a general sense of purpose for the relationship, mm -hmm. and, and, and this, this container, if you like, for what the relationship is about but not making it so specific that it puts you on a tram track. So in terms of practice, so the question perhaps, you know, so what do you want to get out of this? The, the difference between goal parity and, and, and goal alignment would be, we're going to create a goal over against this relationship is going to be purposeful. Mm -hmm. Is that difference? I mean, it's just I, I think it, it, it's all that difference. I'm just trying to get what the difference is between clarity and goal I think there's a difference between having a sense of motion and progress towards to, towards a, a, a horizon mm -hmm. and being and being put on a, on a very narrow path. And, it, and it, that's the difference that I can see. So you can see the horizon. You're not actually sure how you're going to get there. So goal alignment is aligning what with what. Is aligning the sense of purpose that the, co that the client has about what they want to achieve mm -hmm. with the sense of purpose that the, that the coach or the mentor has uh, observed, and, 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 that, and that, that mutual understanding of 
how the person wants to, well, what they want to become, as opposed to necessarily as perhaps instead of what they want to achieve, would be one of the ways of, of, of describing it, although you can argue with that. But it's this sense of general direction as opposed to a narrow path. The sense of the journey rather than the point at the end of the journey. Exactly, yes, yes. Uh, and here's some of the things that the, that the coaches talk about. The coaches have a privilege of sponsors' gender. Yeah. Um, goal setting is an unconsidered routine. You just do it because that's what you do as a coach. You set a goal. You know, the first two or three minutes, you have, right, so what's your goal for this? Um, it's about doing rather than doing more rather than doing less. And, and interestingly, one of the things that we found for observation is the coaches that are most goal focused do a lot more and are much more unintentionally directed. No matter what, you know, whether they're solutions focus or, 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 or almost any other mechanism, they are much more directed in the way that they that they are in control. That they are much more in control of the process than, they are, than those who who do who are less goal focused. Um, <coughs> they serve the coach's need for clarity and control. It's the coach's need for clarity. Um, clients might not have, might not be ready to set goals at this stage. They might just want to understand what's going on, or they might have moved beyond goals. Which is another interesting one. We some of that. Um, goals can be used as an excuse to avoid the painfully beneficial. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, but that's yeah. Um, I, I sometimes talk about having PGH conversations, painful goal honesty conversations every now and then. What is this relationship for? What are we here for? And doing this about you know, once every four or five coaching sessions. Um, I'm being really honest, you know, all this stuff that we've been doing, is it a waste of time? Are we really, no, is this really, honestly, what you in your gut feel is, the, is, is what you want? And those conversations can be very revealing. And the, co and the goals, if you've, got, if you've got a nice goal you can work with, you don't have to be totally present with the client. Um, so all of these things are things that came out of research. Um, and from, our, from the surveys that we've, we've done, looking at getting into a big survey uh, in Muslim countries, looking at primarily the states in Europe, um, and we were looking at you know, people's use of goals. Interestingly, in America, there is a far higher, much stronger um, attachment amongst coaches, particularly in, regard, uh, regardless of how long they've been coaching, um, to goals than there is in Europe. Whereas in Europe, the more experienced a coach you are, the less of an attachment to goals you have. And that's an interesting cultural dimension. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that's, yeah, that's because the way that we take information in Europe is so different from the way that we take it in North America. And an average you know, 20 minute session of, say, training or coaching in um, Europe. Uh, you could take four hours because the Europeans we like to discuss things. Yes. But the Americans and Canadians, no discussion. It's give it to me straight, on we go. Uh, and it can be in 20 minutes. Yeah. And it's all mechanistic. Yes. <coughs> over 90% of American coaching is, is on the telephone. Yes. Uh, telephone coaching is the least effective coaching mm. on the hat. You've got to be really good as a coach to be able to do telephone coaching. Skype helps, yeah. and, that, and that makes it a lot easier. But we know from the various studies of the media that face-to-face -face coaching or email coaching, asynchronous email coaching, both have enormous strengths with different strengths. But telephone coaching is much more difficult, apart from emails, when the other person's silent. You know, how do you know they're still there, or, 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 or are they dead? <laughs> unless, they, unless you get heavy breathing, and that doesn't really yeah. create the right atmosphere, does it? Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, there, there's, there's something about, you know, an over reliance on telephone coaching is dominant. And, and, and some, some of these American coaches will fit in nine or ten clients a day and more. Yeah. Now, you know, is that coaching or is that you know, something else? I wonder whether it's more complex than that because the American coaches also are very new to the idea of supervision. Yes. And <laughs> very resistant yourself to yourself as a coach rather than developing knowledge about coaching. And yes. I wonder whether that also impacts. Yeah. And very res they're very resistant to coaching as well. And they're very resourceful. Yes. Very well. So it's a, it's a different culture. But it, 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 I, they think that difference between American and, American and Europe is, is, is very pronounced. 
Now, I'm going to skip through some things here um, and simply talk and very briefly just to say something about Coach Maturity Seniors. Yeah. Um, well, over the last seven or eight years, we've done a large number of coach assessment centres for large organisations like City Bank College, as we see, or the National Health Service, where we, 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 we help them to choose the coaches that they want to work with. And in the assessment centres, we put them through um, uh, a pretty rigorous process that we've had um, validated by the, the, um, all, all the major associations. Uh, and what we um, and, and we put them through um, um, typically a psychological interview to make sure they're safe, have a good Diana syndrome. You know, you know Diana syndrome, yeah. rushing around the world trying to sort everybody else's problems out, and all not to think about your own. <laughs> um, um, and um, uh, you've all met one of the two of those. Um, the, and, and then you have, uh, so, so are they safe to practice? And then you have the, the panel interview, which is about them as a coach, and then you have the observed real play. So a real client. Um, some lovely, some wonderful coaches. Uh, there's no correlation, by the way, between uh, the number of hours of coaching somebody has done and their competence. Um, you know, but there's no correlation between the particular uh, school that they went to or anything else. That we, the, um, there's no correlation between fee and competence. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, complete, it's completely random. Uh, you only start to get a, a, a correlation between qualification and competence when you get to the master's degree. So, and, and even then, what you get is a high correlation on knowledge, as nothing but not necessarily on, on skill. Um, but even so, these humans, that they should know what they're, what they're doing or not. Um, but, but, <laughs> but, I mean, some, my, fa my favourite coach, is a guy who, who corrals this, 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 this poor client into having a goal. So, so they talk about the goal for a while, and then they, uh, the client suddenly stops after about 50 minutes. We've just sort of grinding from the G into the R. Um, and the client suddenly stops, put his head in his hands, and says, It's no good, no good. My real issue is I don't have a sense of purpose in my life anymore. And the coach says, oh, um, oh, I do empathise. Yeah. Um, if only we had time to deal with that. But let's get back to the subject. <laughs> uh, this guy was trying to roll money. Um, and I think 70% you know, of the coaches that we, that we assess through these processes don't, who've been working for those organisations don't continue working for them because they are so bad. Um, but all that data stream has given us an enormous opportunity to observe what coaches are different type, in different kinds of mindsets or different levels of maturity in the way they think. Um, how do they behave? And this is what we found. So um, sometimes the bottom one we call systemic effect these days because of the, the, we, we change the terminology. But you know, <clears throat> the style of a, of a novice coach, so somebody that's just come into coaching. Yeah, it's, it's about, you know, I've got a model, I've got grow, I've got clear, or, 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 or something else like that, and I'm going to apply it. Yeah. This is doing coaching to the other person. Mm -hmm. um, and because they've only got one model, they, that's all that you can use. So you, the client's problem has got, and the, the client's circumstance, the client's problem, has got to fit your model. Um, and still the majority, over half the coaches that we see, are at that level. Um, then, we, then we find that some of them, they move beyond this, they, go, they get further education, they, go, they, they attend things, you know, seminars like this, they actually grow in their knowledge, they start to absorb other things. And so they begin to, to absorb some processes, so something like clean language, for example, or some of the, things, some of the um, processes related to NLP, NLP first stands for not a lot of proof. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I, usually offend, I usually offend somebody in the audience by pointing out that NLP masters usually have three divorces. Um, um, but um, but the, 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 I'm sure I've offended somebody by that. <laughs> but the idea behind the process is, is you know, you've got more flexibility. The client is allowed to drive the process a bit more, but you're still in charge. And you've got your processes, you're putting them through, but you've got, you've got a, a greater variety. The philosophy-based or discipline-based sometimes, um, they come from two, <laughs> from two, two directions. And, and this is doing coaching with the client. And, the, and, the, and, and these people, they, they either come in from something like shout, 
or from another discipline, a counseling discipline, where they've got a lot of tools from there and they can mix that with the coaching processes and actually create something that's highly client-centered. Um, uh, or, or, they can't, or, or they have such a lot of tools and, and knowledge and they've done such a lot of reflection uh, that they are stopping to, they're now moved from doing coaching to being a coach and they have their own philosophy of coaching that is, in, that is integrated with, their, with them and who they are. And they're all very different. But the point, but they are not imposing it on the client, they're using that richness to, to, to be able to respond most effectively to the client. And then the systemic or managed eclectic. These are, these are a very small percentage, but when, you, when you're in a room with one, it's absolutely fantastic. So we, we, one, on one occasion, we had three models-based coaches, one after the other, one afternoon. And by the time we got halfway through the third, the other assessor and I were desperately trying to keep awake because it is incredibly tiring. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of noise going on, a lot of waving of arms, you know, a lot of talking, but that's never really an impact. Um, and, and, and you didn't feel just a sense of purpose, a sense of progress. But these guys, they're very still, very calm. Things, there's an electricity in the air. Um, and you know, it, 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 it's, it's quite a privilege to watch them. And they ask very few questions, but very powerful questions. You know, over 80% of the bloody difficult questions that we managed to, to, to extract from, 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 the, uh, from um, one particular session, we measured it. Uh, um, so we had 60 something coaches. And 80% of those of the, of, the, of, the re of the really powerful questions came from about five or six of the coaches. Right, so, and, and, and they spoke very little. Um, the, you know, the, the, what they did, <coughs> the way I need to describe it, is they held the client while the client had the conversation they needed to have with themselves. And they were so relaxed and so confident that they, were, that they were in a completely different place to the other levels of coaches. Now, you know, I'm not saying that there's, I'm not making judgments about you know, what's right, and, and, but what, we, what, what has been suggested is that you would associate the performance coaching and skills coaching much more with those first two. It would be very difficult to do transformational coaching, for example, if you were at, except being in the, in the, in the bottom two. Um, and we're all in a place where, you know, where we, 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 we might aspire to moving down here, but it takes a lot of self-reflection, a lot of wisdom, accumulated wisdom. Mm. Um, so can, I, can I just ask you, I mean, you're, you're proposing a model that, that applies to different coaches, and it now applies to different situations as well. So that a, a, a systemic coach, presumably, Somebody thinks they need some of the direction, particularly a mentoring situation, control. Um, is it your is your place to to um, move them beyond that or out? No, I'm I'm not I'm not making any judgments or or any statements around it. Yeah. One of the interesting things is that some that uh, we take take a real example. We'll take Miles Dell, yeah. very much a performance coach. Yeah. yeah. But Miles has gone so far beyond that that actually he's much more, he's much more, he's between someone in, in these last two. Mm -hmm. um, and and the way that he can, when you actually watch what he does, he behaves like this more like a systemic coaching, even though his philosophy is very firmly based in performance coaching. I find that quite interesting. So I don't think there are absolutes around this. This is a sort of general, a, a, a generic model of thinking about how you're evolving your thinking. Mm. And the label that you give yourself, mm. or allow other people to give you, um, mm. is almost irrelevant to that. The real trick of being a great coach, to be able to switch in and out of it, is when, when asked and needed. Yeah, I think that may be true as well. Yes. Because yeah. there are times when you sometimes do need to go back to, yeah. back to basics if somebody's got a very simple issue they want to deal with. Um, uh, or if you're, I, mean, well, I do a lot of work with disabled, learning disabled kids. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you're not going to be working down the system if you're them with it. And do you think it's a matter of time that 
progression. I think time is one of the factors, but the critical, but it's time in order to be able to really reflect. And what would suggest is the process by which you develop coaches then that are capable of being systemic? What what kinds of things do you think would be appropriate for that development? Okay. Well, what I'm about to say is not based on evidence. It's based upon, it's just a speculation. Okay, because we don't have the evidence for it. But my, my perception is that many coaches are not capable of getting there because they don't have the capacity for self-reflection that comes with partly who you are, it's partly how you, the way that you think. So, um, uh, but those that do, it's a matter, it does take time and it's about who you associate with and who, who you see as your peers, who you have conversations with, how you stretch yourself and develop yourself. But isn't that how many counsellors or people working in psychiatry and mental health have transformed themselves? Because if you take the philosophy of systemic working and working with systems, there are people then that actually can go back into a group because they actually create a system that's supporting that individual to work with the system of the family, for example. Yeah. yeah? And, and, or they, or they ha and they do have that time to reflect or, or gain uh, supervision and reflection to go and talk about this case. Yeah. So there's a lot more people thinking and supporting the coach to help the coaching. Uh, I agree. And many counsellors and, co and, 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 and psychologists are able to move into, move into the coaching mode very, very well. Yeah. But, but I'm, mode, I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to raise, just for my own understanding, is if I'm working in, in mental health, I, could, I can choose to be psychodynamic, I can choose to be cognitive, yeah. systemic or whatever. In terms of the role of the coach, there is this new creation that, that we are stepping in and out of different phases. But we may not be as so intense about what we're doing as somebody who might be deeply trained. Deeply trained. Yes. 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 <laughs> Sorry. And in some ways, that's the value of being a of Yeah, because being... that is the difference, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether these are character descriptions rather than you know. I, I think there's an issue. I, I, I think certain people are drawn <laughs> to certain. Yeah. Certain. Yeah. I mean, what, I'm to, what I'm very careful not to do is, 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 to, is to make statements about this that I don't have evidence for. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we've got evidence for is we observe these different mindsets mm -hmm. and, they, and, the, and they are related to the overall competence of the coaches in dealing with the issues that people are brought to. Mm -hmm. I, I think what well, this is really helpful is I, I work a lot in the university with new coaches that are learning to be a coach. And I think this is really helpful because it's quite hard to describe to them mm. about that, like you're saying, that evolution of coach maturity. And of course, a, a wonderful place to start with them is models based because it's yeah. so important. They can, and so when you talk about character and skills development, they're so inextricably linked. And some people might look at that and go, actually, I don't think I'm ever going to be, you know, the, the last one. I'm probably just going to speak at the first two. That's what my organisation is after. That's what my clients are looking yeah. for, whatever the reason. Yeah. But I think it's just really helpful for CPD mm -hmm. person to actually just have that written up. Mm -hmm. And then you can mm -hmm. interpret it and however you want for your own personal development. Well, we've done a couple of articles around this, chapters of books and things around this, so we can need to reference with you. Well, that would be great. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you know, it, it, it's an observation that can be used as, as it's helpful to you. Yeah. 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 Do you not think it's a little bit like the whole um, you know, conscious competence? I think you, you, people have mapped, people have mapped the, 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 those uh, the, the conscious and unconscious competence onto. People have, have also mapped um, the Keegan um, um, yeah. development. Yeah. Yeah. People, so people map various various things onto it, and I said that's fine. If that works for you, mm. that, that's good. I'm not. I'm. We're not making claims for it without actually doing more research into it to, to demonstrate it. I think there's so much out there that, that, that around in the coaching world, which is simply based on somebody having an idea and saying, therefore it must be true. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, you know, and, and, I, and I'm very conscious that I don't want to fall into that trap. But if you, but some research around that, yeah, does it work? Brilliant. I think it's very difficult though, because the character and all that, it's very difficult to actually explain it. Yeah. Well, I have a little trick that I do, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, 
I give my, when I thought of coaching like that, many of my coaches, I, I give them homework to do. Yeah. Something to think about. Yeah. And so when I've got something like that, I say, well, if you're familiar with these models, let's just really go through this model with you. And you know, it has pluses and minuses, but you know, it's a good way of helping you construct your thinking. So between now and then, you go away and work on this and have the conversation with yourself about this, and then bring that into our, into our conversation, and we'll see what we do with that. So that's something for you to go away and play with, and you, you, you know, contact me in between if you're struggling with it. Um, but then it passes the responsibility back onto them, and it's a way of helping them structure their thinking before they get into the real coaching. Um, but but that, that's, I, I find that's a very, set, a very good way of getting away from that, having this stuff over-structure the coaching conversation, because then we lose most of the value from it. I'm wondering what this is meant to say, because I mean, clearly that's, that is a hierarchy there, to some extent, it is. Um, in your mind. I mean, visualizing that, that systemic coach, and uh, how, would you try to, how would you try to create that image? With a, a, a you know a, a, in a supervision session, uh, I think what what we tended to do is to make them, is, is to make them aware yeah. of these transitions. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that immediately gets you that I worry about, and I, I would have difficulty supervising somebody if somebody, oh yes, I'm 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 on the cusp of being a systemic eclectic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, and I think you have to say, well, it doesn't matter where you are. Where you are is a good place to be. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so it's actually then saying, okay, you know, in terms of the journey that you want, you want to make, what, what is your vision of what the next step you want to make looks like? So, do you actually need to have a lot more models to work with? Yeah. What is your confidence in your ability to be able to throw everything out the window and just listen and have you know, have a simple conversation with very little intervention? One of the thing exercises I do when I've been training coaches is I tell them they can only speak three or four times in an hour. Um, now they'll break it, of course. But what happens is that they find the quality of the statements or questions they ask is significantly improved. And have you matched that with the research into the um, reviews of the coaches? <coughs> we haven't. No. I mean, the, the only way we've been able to do that is where we get, where we, where we, um, in, the, in the assessment centres, we get the feedback from the coaches, the coachees. Um, and interesting, the, 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 the um, evaluation of the coachee and the coach and the observers is very highly correlated. Mm -hmm. And those coaches who we perceive, you know, the, the models based coaches tend to think themselves better, but much, much better than they are. Mm -hmm. Whereas the systemic eclectics, you know, are, are much more critical of themselves, but actually there's a, there's a balancing effect there. You know, mm -hmm. They're much more aware. And so we, we, we find that the quality of observation, self-observation, mm -hmm. um, by the systemic effect is very high. And interestingly, these two levels will very quickly identify issues they want to take from supervision to supervision. The other two hardly ever do. Sorry, which two? The, the bottom two are constantly thinking, I, I really want to take that for supervision or for yeah. or for, for further discussion and reflection. Mm -hmm. The top two have no have no idea. Mm -hmm. And they're less inclined to supervision anyway. Yeah. Now, interestingly, a lot of programs looking for, for, for intern, internal coaches, internal mentors, and people working inside companies, seem to be much more, where they provide supervision, the, the people are much keener to, to, to go on and, and much, much more switched on to the value of it. I, I don't know why that is, but I find that an interesting phenomenon. I mean, there's something here, I mean, I, I, I'm hesitant to introduce. Is this all right for just to carry on the conversation like this? Yeah. When, when do you want to finish? <laughs> Something we do, we do. I've got a meeting with Nancy Klein to try on um, on Monday to try and design a research program on the project program. Around it. So we've been doing some some um, some pre research like, with coaches around a, 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 a model that we've developed of attentive or listening. Now, um, what we, what we defer, the way that we do this, we go out and we listen to coaches about talking about their practice and how, and we want to know how do you actually, what, what's going on in your head when you're listening. So we get this data, we boil it down, and we get a story. 
it's, and then we begin <coughs> to, to look to see some relations in this, or, 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 or categories in this. Um, and then we go out, go out and see what actually, what actually happened for you. And we, out of that, we, we, we ended up with five levels, of, or five kinds of listing. So they, they, and then they, they were, the first two might be any, we will be very familiar to you. There's, there's listening to, to, to argue, or acute, and then there's, there's this one which sort of could be one or two, but we tend to join them together for simplicity, which is listening to, to say something, you know, put your own foot in it, or to ask a question. And sometimes we talk about the tyranny of the question because you spend so much time thinking about the next question, you're not really attending. Um, the third one is listening to understand. The fourth one is listening to help the other person understand. And the fifth one is listening without intent. <laughs> yeah? So you're just allowing things to happen. Now, the thesis that we're working on, or the theory that we're working on, is that what's actually happening, in particularly in the systemic eclectics, is that they're listening, is, is, is that the analogy is with the human eye. Now, when, I don't know if you've come across the term microsaccade. Yeah. A, a microsaccade, if, 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 the eye is like television a screen, a screen. It has to be, ref, the image has to be reflected several times a second for you to be able to see anything. Right? And so what's happening in, in a, television, a television screen is, is that a, a new picture keeps coming all the time. And with the, and with the eye, I'm sorry, with, 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 uh, with the eye, what happens is the pupil is good possible. Cheers. Um, and what, happen, what comes out of it, if you take that analogy for, 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 for our listening and our attentiveness, it seems that we are at our most attentive when we are shifting between these different, or some of these different um, times. Now, if we're going into listening to argue, that takes over our brain and we don't do anything. We, 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 yeah, we lose out completely. But what's been described to us when we ask coaches what's going on for you is that they have a centre of gravity on this, on, on, between the other four. Um, and by coming by, and what they have told us is that by becoming more attentive to that centre of gravity, they've been able to shift it more up the scale. So they're spending more time, so, so they're trying, they, they, they see value in shifting it more into the listening to help somebody else understand. And it's interesting, we don't define that, we just let them define it themselves. Um, and then you sort of you go back up and down into, into, into the other levels. But that they feel that, they, that what they say is they feel more attentive when they're doing that, and they say their clients feel they're more attentive. Now, that is enti it's entirely subjective. So you know, what we're now talking about here with Nancy is can we actually find a, an objective way of doing this, and that might involve um, you know, brain energy um, and experiments. So we, we don't know where we're going to go with this. Does the, does the model make sense to you? Um, all I can say is, if, if it makes sense to you, and, and you're just attentive to where you are in your coaching sessions, if you then say, actually, I want to be in a different place, you know, I want a different centre of gravity, simply attending to it will begin to take you there. So we think. But for the evidence, we have to wait for a while. I hope I've given you some interesting things to think about. That's usually my, my task. Um, and um, happy to talk for a little while for more and copy of it. If anybody wants the slides, by the way, I'm sure we can distribute them. Thank you enormously, David. You certainly took me lots of things off, and I think everybody else I'm absolutely exploded in the door. So thank you so much. If you want to um, watch, catch up on what we've been talking about again, you've actually probably noticed that it's been video at the moment, and you'll find the videos uh, from this and from the session we had a few weeks ago all being put up onto our online site, so you'll find them there. So please do have a look yourselves or point them out to other people. Um, I'd really like to thank you and to also um, just to flag up that actually David has nominated his charity that he'd like um, the money from tonight, or part of the donation from tonight's money that we made is going to spy special people on ice. Do you want to say anything about it? It's quite unusual. I didn't know about it until I looked on the web. It, it's something, it, it, it evolves out uh, ten years ago, my wife and I decided that we have a learning disabled side of I spent a long time working with teaching him to skate. And in fact, he's going to be taking a sort of disabled Olympic shortly. Um, oh. um, and he's now 26. 
But 10 years ago, we decided we'd create the first ice skating club for learning to save the kids. And um, so um, every, everybody said you couldn't do this. They, they'll never learn to skate. Well, they can. Uh, I, I work with some of the most difficult ones. One of my ones that I work with, she's hemiplegic. Only, only her left side works. And she can shuffle her right foot. There's no, no use for her right arm. She's skating. They're quite amazing. And every year for the last eight years, we've had them in the Christmas show. Um, and um, again, this year. So if you fancy seeing a Christmas show, you know, if you fancy a Christmas show with something different to the second half, um, Slough Ice Arena is, is where it's going to be on the 18th, 19th, and 20th. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a great uh, way of helping these young people become included, gain self-esteem, um, and also, surprisingly, we found it helps to work of uh, those people with severe dyspraxia. Yes. Yeah. It helps the kids actually overcome mm -hmm. their dyspraxia to some extent. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Your donation will be going big, sent to that. And I think that most of you will have picked up a programme on your way in of uh, future events that we're going to have. This is just the next ones that are coming up in the next few months. The next one you'll see that is um, Jane Cox talking about our use of language and about the impact of the coaching relationship. Jane is actually here, so if you do want to catch her and talk to her about a session, you might hear it. We've got a few other people who are here who are going to be running um, sessions in the future. Claire Pedrick, who's just sitting there, you'll see she's doing one on the 16th of April on systemic ethics. And Janice Cook, who's sitting there, and you've got yours on the 30th of April, so you're both April people together, <laughs> which is nice, on collaborative action coaching for leaders. Um, so thank you ever so much. If you're keen to do one and you'd like to come along, please let me know. Do email me.